Sure. Um, welcome committee members, liaisons, and members of the public to the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission Rules Committee meeting. Thank you for joining us. We're using Zoom with the goal to foster a more inclusive environment and effective meeting. If you would like to comment during the meeting, please use the raised hand feature. To use the raised hand feature by phone, dial star nine on your phone's dial pad to raise your hand and do the same to lower your hand. Please utilize this tool to virtually indicate that you would like to speak in order to help the chair facilitate the discussion. Please note that all legal services, trust fund commission and committee meetings will be recorded and posted to the state bar website. Friendly reminder that this is a video conference and to please be aware of your surroundings behind you. Zoom captioning is available to enable, select the live transcript option at the bottom of your Zoom screen and then select enable auto transcription. Great, thank you. Why don't we do roll call and then we'll do public comment. I know that's a little out of order, but seems to make more sense. Great. Connolly? Here. Osaroff? Fightmaster? Here. Blakemore? Bushelli? Here. Campbell? Here. Galkin? Meeker? Here. We have quorum. Let me do... Um, our liaisons, Copeland, Selena. Okay, and I don't see anybody from the Judicial Council. And the State Bar staff, um, we have Raul and Brady. Erica's here, I'm here. Um, and then I'll turn it back over to you, Erica. We do have um, some members of the public um, that are in attendance, if you would like to do public comments now. Great, why don't we do public comments? Um, just as a reminder, we, um, Generally, we'll kind of leave it to about three minutes per comment. And um, if you are referencing a particular agenda item, if you could let us know that just so that we are, have some context, that'd be helpful. So um, who do we have first? Just one person. Yeah, could you unmute the person? Yes. Hi, this is Gary Smith. Hi there. Um, I want to address the uh, uh, recommendation with respect to fee generating cases, if I might. Um, I'm the executive director of Legal Services of Northern California, which is an IOLTA funded organization that covers 23 counties <clears throat> in Northern California. I've been the executive director for about 24 years. Um, we are also uh, funded by the Federal Legal Services Corporation, so I'm very familiar with uh, LSC's fee generating case rule, um, from which the IELTA rule seems to have been taken many years ago. I want to speak just briefly and very narrowly to one issue in this current recommendation, which pertains to the definition of a quote fee generating case. If I understand the in the current interpretation and this recommendation, the definition of a fee generating case will include all cases where there is a potential quote, fee shifting provision involved in the underlying litigation, uh, whereby a plaintiff who uh, uh, wins or, or prevails in the underlying case through a judgment or settlement um, uh, can move for an award of fees from their opponent. Having litigated uh, cases involving fee shifting provisions for 30 years now, I can tell you that simply because there is a, a possibility of a fee award from the opponent because there's a fee shifting provision uh, in, the, in the underlying statute does not mean uh, in the language of the former LSC rule that the case may quote reasonably may be expected to result in a fee from the opposing party. That's because there are very few fee shifting statutes would automatically result in, in a fee award. Most fee shifting statutes require the, the plaintiff or the petitioner first to establish that they prevailed under the, the merits of the statute, and that's a term of art, to be a prevailing party. Then, and most importantly, they have to establish that they meet some sort of substantive standard imposed by the fee provision. Um, and then uh, they have to show uh, that uh, they have to litigate the reasonableness of their of their hours and rates. So, for example, at page seven in the executive summary of this recommendation, it's proposed that a case brought under the Federal Equal Access to Justice Act would be a fee generating case because the EAJA has a fee shifting provision. 
but there's no uh, uh, automatic entitlement to a fee under that statute. Far from it. If you if you sue a government entity under the EAJA, uh, and you first you have to establish that you prevailed under the statute by winning or settling, but then you have to even if you meet the definition of a prevailing party. Uh, you can only claim fees if the court finds that the government's position in the underlying case is not substantially justified. That's a very high bar. Many plaintiffs who win their case can't go, go on and, and, and argue that the government's position in the litigation uh, wasn't substantially justified. Many other uh, fee-shifting statutes also require the plaintiff to meet a high substantive standard. For example, the California's private attorney general statute, uh, uh, Code of Civil Procedure 1021.5, that requires a plaintiff uh, before establishing the entitlement to seek fees to demonstrate that they have, quote, enforced an important right affecting the public interest and conferred a significant benefit on the general public or a large class of persons. And, and there are very, various other requirements as well. So. These are very high bars, and just because you know they they exist sort of in theory under many of these fee shifting statutes, they're not automatic entitlements. So I don't think that just because a case arises under a statute that includes a fee shifting provision should sweep it automatically into the definition of a fee generating case. And I'm also aware of no legal services corporation rule that does so either. Um, yeah, for the purposes of its own uh, fee shifting uh, uh, or fee generating case rule. So th those are my remarks. Thanks. Thank you very much. Are there, um, uh, Brady, you have your hand raised? You're, you're on mute, sorry. I just wondered if I could ask a follow-up question of Gary. Yes, yes, please. Um, so with the LSC, you know, how do you, um, do they just categorically, you know, the fee shifting cases aren't under those fee shifting statutes you referenced, um, EJA just aren't treated no, as no. fee shifting cases? I, I, you know, my impression, Brady, is that, um, uh, and what I do is um, if a case in the, in the rare event where a case um, um, where there's a fee shifting provision that uh, provides for an automatic entitlement to fees if you win or settle in the underlying case, I would include that as a fee generating case for LSC purposes. And then I'd go on to, um, you know, deal with the exceptions or or with other, other machinations that we go through with respect to LSC's fee generating case. I don't know of uh, like I said, I don't know of any LSC rule that, you know, deals with the fee shifting provisions of a case um, uh, in any in any organized way. I've I've actually never looked at it. LSC has never, you know, asked us about it. So I mean, our our perspective, and and again, you you have obviously the familiarity with what happens in practice. Um, <clears throat> looking at their documents was that you know these cases would be reasonably, um, you know, you're not going to presumably you're not taking a, a case that you know is a a, a total loser. You you just like a private attorney wouldn't want to waste um, your time. Um, but but our thought was that the that the that the exceptions are pretty capacious, especially in terms of the um, the exception for uh, you know uh, cases of a type that uh, attorneys in private practice in the area ordinarily do not accept. Um, and so we you know we we after feedback. Um, from the community, you know, don't no longer re recommend a, a requirement for records. But but the thought there would be, hey, if you you establish the criteria for the cases that 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 um, you know attorneys in private practice don't take, maybe they don't take EGA cases below this value or whatever, and then that's your criteria for for imposing that. The purpose, you know, for both this and the LSC rule is. And again, this you know this uh, one clarification uh, to keep in mind is that this this only speaks to how you can use our funds. Right. Um, it, it, right. it doesn't go to primary purpose or um, or qualified expenditures. But the thought is, hey, if you're taking the LSC funds, hey, if you're taking these funds, we don't want them to go towards cases that would be taken by private attorneys without charge to their clients. Yeah, and, and I think 
I I think that's the you know that's the core of 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 what the LSC rule is all about, and I assume it and it in but again, um, and and we undergo the same analysis that you just looked at in terms of well, is this case that you know on its face you know might look like a fee generating case? Is it something that a private attorney would actually take? Um, and the answer if, uh, for almost all of the cases that we do is no. Um, and we we document that um, and um, in in ways that the uh, that the LSC uh, fee generating case rule um, uh, tells us to do. And and then and then we go forward. OK, but Can I, if you don't mind, I'm going to kind of interject here just to if there's other people who have public comment, I want to make sure they have an opportunity to be heard. And then, Mr. Smith, I invite you to remain on the line because this is our um, like last agenda item. And so if you'd like to be available in case the commission, the committee has questions, you know, we'd love for you to be available. Are there okay. any other? Yeah. Uh, are there any other? I'm sorry, I, I'm going to have to go. I, that's oh, why okay. I put a comment here, but I'm certainly available if anyone, uh, you know, you guys, have, most of you have my contact information. I'm okay. happy to take questions or emails or anything like that. So Great. Thank, and thank we, appreciate, we appreciate your, your comments. This is very helpful information for us. Thank you. Are, are there any other individuals who have public comment? Nobody no. else is indicating they want to speak. Okay, and I just to make sure we note, uh, Selena has um, is now in attendance, so I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Okay, without any other um, uh, public comment at the moment, why don't we move to our um, the approval of minutes? I actually have a comment really quick before we get into it, which is my votes have, were not recorded on either of the. Um, motions oh so um it would i think i voted i for both of them but my name just somehow didn't end up in there oh, so sure. so i would re request that that be amended <laughs> um and then if there are any other comments um on the minutes please feel free to let us know okay hearing none um Duan, would it be easier to, should it be easier to just like make a motion subject to the amendment of adding? Yeah, my yeah, name? That, okay. yeah. So um, I'll take any motions to approve it with the amendment that I proposed. J Jim, are you going to move or Will? I'll move. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, sure. move. I'll will second. Oh, okay, Vanetta is will second. Okay. I'll do roll call. I'll start off. Fightmaster? Yes. Blakemore? Bashelli? Yes. Campbell? Yes. Galkin? Meeker? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Great. Motion passes. Great. Okay, so now we're going to move into our discussion and action items. And the first agenda piece is something that Will wanted to present for us and, and a discussion piece from him. So I'll turn it over to him to let us know what it is that we are you to talk with us about. Hey, everyone. I am, I am fine going second since we just had a sort of robust conversation on that second agenda item. But it's it's up to the the commission uh, if we want to continue since we're all all now in that mental framework. Um, I'm fine with that, but I I don't know what the preference is. Okay, uh, that's fine. We can move to the fee generating if unless there's any concerns about going out of order. I assume that's okay. Why don't we do the fee generating and then we'll 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 take up your matter after. Um, okay, so I think we turn this one over to Brady and Raul. And Raul, are you going to be sharing your, your own slides? Yes. Uh, so give me one second. I, I was just going to say, I'm uh, Raul will be leading this. I'm I'm uh, eating my lunch, so I will. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Thanks, Raul. All right. Do you all see my screen? Yes. We see it. Yes. Okay, great. All right. So I'll get started. Um, so I'm going to discuss uh, proposed revisions to State Bar Rule 3.673B governing the use of funds for fee generating casework. 
Uh, and so I'll start with the statutory framework. Um, first is Business and Professions Code section 6223A. Uh, it states, and I'll paraphrase, uh, that no funds allocated by the state bar shall be used for the provision of legal assistance with respect to any fee generating case except in, in accordance with state bar guidelines. Uh, I want to note that this restriction speaks to the use of IOLTA funds, not whether fee generating work can be counted toward a primary purpose or as a qualified expenditure. Uh, I also want to note that the rationale um, is to ensure that scarce IOLTA funds are not used on cases where a private attorney would be available and willing to perform the work. Uh, as part of uh, this process, we received a concern that the rule is meant to protect uh, private sector attorneys from competition. I just want to clarify that that's definitely not the case. Uh, the Business and Professions Code also defines what is a fee-generating case. Uh, in section 6213E, it states that a fee-generating case means a case or matter that if undertaken on behalf of an indigent person by an attorney in private practice, reasonably may be expected to result in a payment of a fee for legal services from an award to a client from public funds or from the opposing party. Um, so section 6213E also provides for various exemptions from what counts as a fee generating case. Um, I want to try to actually go through these and paraphrase them a bit just because I think they're relevant to our discussion um, later on. Uh, so the first exemption is for uh, if the recipient determines that a free referral is not possible because of any of the following reasons. A, that the case has been rejected by a local lawyer referral service or of no such service by two attorneys in private practice with experience uh, with the type of case. B, that the, neither, referral, neither the referral service nor an attorney will consider the case without payment of a consultation fee. C, that the case is the type that attorneys in private practice in the area do not ordinarily accept and do not accept without prepayment of a fee. And D, that emergency circumstances compel immediate action before a referral can be made. Uh, the other three exemptions are for when recovery of damages is not the principal object of the case, uh, where the court has appointed a recipient or employee of a recipient pursuant to a statute or court rule, and for that the case involves the right to a claimant under a public supported benefit program for which entitlement to benefit is based on need. Uh, the relevant state bar rule concerning fee generating cases is rule 3.673B. Uh, I won't read this to you, but two important things to note. It requires that recipients maintain records reflecting the facts that led to a conclusion that a case is, fits under one of the exemptions. And it also requires that any fees generated from a fee generating case only be used, quote, for purposes permitted by statute. So I guess one of the existing concerns based on the current rule, uh, based on the existing statute and rules, um, staff experience and feedback we got in this process, there's a few things that came up. First is that there is some confusion, I think, as to what counts as a fee generating case. Uh, it also uh, came to light that the state bar has little to no window into how grantees are actually invoking particular exemptions. Although they're required to document uh, the facts leading to the termination of an exemption, they're not required to submit those records to the state bar. And in practice, um, the invocation of exemptions has been, uh, has not been a focus for state bar staff. And finally, uh, that the rule that recovery of fees and fee generated cases may only be used as permitted by statute is perhaps not as clear as it could be. Okay, so considering how to approach um, a potential revision to the fee generating case rule, it was useful to look to the federal analog in the Legal Services Corporation Act and its regulations. Uh, the federal regulation also contains a definition for fee generating cases with a similar prohibition on, of the use of such funds in such cases and exemptions that parallel those that apply for the state bar. Uh, I'll just note that the state bar rules are almost certainly borrowed from the LSC regulations as the original definition in the federal regulation is identical to that of the state bars. However, in 2017, uh, the LSC's regulation was revised 
Um, and I have here the 2017 version up top and the current state bar definition to illustrate the difference. And as you'll see, the, the main difference is the missing language in red, uh, which in the state bar says that um, includes cases for where a fee is from legal services, from an award, from public funds, or from the opposing party. Uh, when the LSC changed the regulation, they stated that it was to make sure that the language an award was not read to only modify to a client, um, but should have modified also pu from public fund and from opposing party. This means that the issue with fee generating cases is not that it receives funds from public funds, but it if it results from an award from public funds. Um, in other words, funds um, obtained in suits against the government. So uh, we wanted to discuss an example of where the lack of clarity of uh, the definition of fee-generating case came up in the past. In 2019, uh, the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission discussed the application of a grantee that was receiving partial funding from a judicial entity to provide services to indigent parents and children in a juvenile dependency system. Out of concern that the funds were from public funds and would run afoul of the rule, uh, the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission recommended that funds not be budgeted in cases where the grantee had the, an existing funding contract. However, this should not have been an issue because the source of funds in this case would not have come from an award of public funds. Uh, I also want to discuss just a couple examples of where um, recent examples where invocation of the fee generating case exemptions have come up. Uh, so in 2022, the State Bar learned that about half of the grantee's revenue was derived from attorney's fees available in special education related cases. Uh, the grantee staff had expressed to the State Bar that recovery of attorney's fees in those cases was a significant focus for them, and it influenced the decision on whether to provide representation in individual cases. Uh, ultimately, the decision on how to handle that was deferred until after codification. Um, however, I do want to note, although um, whether recovery of significant attorney's fees is a focus in a case um, is one of the available exemptions, and so in this case, when they would likely not be eligible for it, it's, it's 6213E2, that does not mean that, that the, these cases would not fit within another exemption, for example, that uh, this type of case that private attorneys would not ordinarily take. And for the third example, uh, this is sort of just a classic example of how this probably works. Um, in 2022, a, a grantee expressed concerns that they were handling fee generating cases. Um, those cases involve representation of elder abuse clients where mandatory attorney fees are available. In, in that case, the state bar determined that since the grantee represented to us that private attorneys would not typically assume the type of representation and also that the recovery of attorney's fees was not the, the main purpose for taking on the representation, that uh, this type of work was exempt under uh, Business and Professions Code section 6213E1C and E2. So uh, we prepared an initial proposal and shared it with the Legal Aid Association of California. Um, based on their feedback, main concerns were that the definition of fee generating was too broad. Um, for example, that it would address, that it would capture fee shifting statutes. Uh, although I, fee, fee shifting statutes necessarily, I think, fall within the definition. Uh, you know, whether there's a determination that it may reasonably be expected to result in such awards in, in one case versus another, uh, it, it's not something uh, that we've addressed here. Um, I will also note that our proposed revision to the definition is not intended to substantively change the scope of what counts as a fee generating case, merely to clarify um, the definition. Uh, the other concern, so we initially proposed that grantees be required to submit the records that they are required to maintain under the present version of rule 3.673B. However, the feedback we received is, is that this would create significant administrative burden on grantees. So accordingly, and based on uh, you know, 
based on that feedback and staff consideration of the options, our proposal is now threefold. One is to go ahead and clarify the definition of fee generating case to match the federal analog to ensure it only applies to funds from quote, an award. Uh, to, to avoid the burdensome uh, documentation requirements that we instead ask grantees to self-certify that any fee generating case is exempt. And finally, to clarify the, the rule to ensure that the recovery of attorney's fees are only used to provide services to the indigent. Uh, so here I have the sort of mock-up language of the revision to rule 3.673. Uh, it's there's three main parts. One, uh, the crossing out in red of purposes permitted by statute and adding quote civil civil legal services to the indigent in California. That's just to clarify that the recovery of attorney's fees in any of these fee generating cases are only used for such purposes. Uh, second, uh, it imposes the certification requirement uh, by adding language that says recipients must certify with their annual IOLTA slash EAF application that any fee generating case that received funds is exempt. And finally, in adding section C, it adopts the federal analog definition of what is a fee generating case. So although this isn't addressed in our uh, proposed uh, revision to rule 3.673, I did want to tee up for discussion um, how state bar staff should consider implementing the self certification requirement if that's indeed adopted. As a reminder, uh, rule 3.673 requires if re that if a recipient determines that a case is not fee generating because it qualifies for a statutory exemption, the recipient must maintain records reflecting the facts that led to that conclusion and any action taken to confirm it. Uh, but the question remains whether we should allow grantees to certify, do a blanket certification by the types of cases they handle or require certification on a case by case basis. Uh, how to self-certify and uh, what records they're required to maintain likely depend on the type of, in, of exemption that is invoked. So for example, um, E1A, E1B, and E3, uh, that's the exemption for where uh, it's been rejected by a referral service or two private attorneys that an attorney will not consider it without a consultation fee or involves a court appointed recipient. That type of exemption may simply require maintenance of emails and other documentation. Exemption E1C involving um, a sort of statement that private practice attorneys do not normally accept that type of case, you know, may require establishing the criteria defining what types of cases are not normally accepted by attorneys in the area. Oh, sorry. Um, E1D is about, um, is the exemption for emergency circumstances. Again, there may be some documentation about those circumstances. And then exemption E2 and E4. So E2 is where recovery of attorney's fees is not the principal object of the case. And E4 is where a claim is under a publicly supported benefit program based on need. Those could likely be uh, documented simply by uh, maintaining the pleadings indicating the, the case type. So just again, for reference here, the exemptions. Um, okay, and then, so, so based on, on that, the summary of our recommendations as follows, that we adopt the proposed language from the federal analog to the definition of fee generating to ensure it only applies fees generated from award, uh, that we impose a self-certification requirement on grantees with a, an additional focus by state bar staff on, on how those exemptions are invoked. And finally, clarify that only um, that fees recovered in such cases may only be used for the provision of services of, to the indigent in California. Um, and so if, if the committee approves the language I have here for the proposal uh, is as follows, that the Rules Committee of the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission approves the proposed 
modification to the state bar rule 3.673 as discussed and recorded at the meeting on April 27th, 2023. Um, and, and if we wanna make any revisions to the actual wording, I can, I can also pull up that language for, for revision and discussion. Great. Thanks, Raul. Uh, Jim, you have your hand raised? Uh, yeah, I got a couple of questions. Um, is there any definition about what is reasonably may be expected gener to generate a fee? Because what I gathered from Gary's discussion comments earlier is that there are a lot of these cases that you can win, but not necessarily generate a fee. So what does reasonably mean? 50% of the cases, 90% of the cases, 10% of the cases? Because uh, it, it sounds to me, some of these cases, the way Gary Smith was presenting it, you're not always going to get the fee. That's one question. The second question is where it said the fees could only be used permitted by statute. You're getting rid of that and saying civil legal services, but did the statute ever define what other uses could be done or used with the fees? And then finally, I got a little confused. It seemed like fee generating and fee shifting were being used interchangeably. And I'm not, I don't know, I don't understand what a fee shifting situation is. Yeah, so uh, see if I can address those in turn. So um, the definition of like reasonably may be expected wasn't something uh, that was focused for us when we were looking into this. Um, I will say, you know, we have, we consider with the, um, with the exemptions that the grantees consider, that they'd be required to self-certify. So um, I, I imagine that's something we can consider developing criteria about, about why something where a, an award is available um, would not reasonably be expected to result in award. Um, but, but I don't have a proposal for that at the moment. Well, let, me, let me jump in. What I was hearing from Gary is not actually, I wasn't actually hearing an issue with this or any real conflict with LSE because I mean, by nature, the whole point of these fee shifting cases, and I'll address that question also, is that you know you you take them if they're merit merit meritorious, uh, which again you're you're taking them because you think you have a reasonable chance of winning, um, you'll get fees. Um, the 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 giant hole in that, which is totally consistent with the purposes of this, is if you can say you know oh for these reasons, and you don't you know our, our thought was that you'd basically. You know the attorneys in your area, you as a grantee, so you're going to say these are the types of cases that, um, um, you know, fee shifting cases that that um, that um, attorneys in this area just don't take, and then that that satisfies the exemption. Um, you know, this the, the 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 language both from the LSC regulation, which we're now matching, is is pretty clear that it is it is the whole point of the regulation is to get these fee shifting cases. Now, a fee generating case, that's just the, the words from the IOLTA statute and the LSC regulations. Um, fee shifting is, is any case where if you win, um, you, um, you know, you're entitled to attorney's fees. It's the, they're the exception to the American rule where each side pays its own. So I, I and I'd, I'd wish Gary had stayed on because I, I didn't, I didn't really I see. I think he might as, still be on. I think I saw just saw his hand raised like a minute yeah. ago. I mean, I, I I think that our focus just um, 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 conceptually is is on on this. Hey, here here's the universe of cases that this is um, that this rule is targeting, which is uh, cases where uh, you can reasonably expect to get an award, and that's why private practice people would take these kind of cases because they can reasonably expect to get a fee award. Um, but um, there's other exceptions, but if this is the type of case that private attorneys in your area won't take, uh, you know, then it's an exception. And I, I wasn't hearing necessarily that this is different than what, what, what's happening with, with LSE. Thanks, Brady. Dwan? Yeah, I just gotta, um, just, just so that we're all on the same page. Um, I think what I'm hearing Brady and Raul suggest and that's in the memo is that to kind of address Gary's concern about, you know, in some of these uh, provisions, there's not an automatic kind of uh, attorney's fees in the, these instances, um, but they can get, they can still evoke the exemption if they just have an internal policy. So it's like one, one additional step that I don't think 
LSC is wh whether um, program LSC programs are doing it or they're enforcing it, but that's we're adding one additional step then. Is that is that right then? I mean, it, it still gets at the same end goal, right? So those 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 cases that Gary was talking about. Um, we're not outright stating they're not fee generating, but we can say that you still qualify for an exemption if you have a policy that states for these cases, you you know, private attorneys and private practice won't be able to take them because X, Y, and Z. So is that, am I summarizing it right? Yeah, and I think I, I wasn't actually hearing what um, what LSC was doing because again, they, they define it the same and I, um, we didn't find a, a, a contrary definition. It sounds like there there isn't one. So maybe it was, um, I'm not sure how that reporting works, but yeah. um, this seems like a um, seems like a uh, 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 you know relatively low um, burden because again you're gonna you're gonna you know set the criteria and then hey if the cases meet it you self certify, um, but that you know at least for at least asks programs to think about hey you know is this um, is this, is this a case where um, private attorneys in this area would take it because of that expectation of fees? And if it is, um, they should um, they should try to get it. If it doesn't meet the criteria, then there's another exception that if that person goes out and can't get the um, can't get the uh, you know the lawyer referral service uh, uh, refuses it, or I think um, do I have it? Um, to private attorney in private private practice. So, I mean, it's sort of a, 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 a double check because the organization under um, exemption C in the statute um, would have a policy that says, hey, you know, based on our experience of um, our knowledge of the market, you know, these, these fee shifting cases, either by its size or nature or whatever, aren't, private practices aren't gonna take it. If, some, if, a, if a case, um, you know, that comes into intake at one of these grantees doesn't fall into that and the grantee goes out to try and find private attorneys and then can't, there's another exception that says, hey, they can come back. I talked to two private attorneys, they won't they won't take this case. And then that's another exception. So it, it sort of acts as a, um, a pretty simple, um, not a lot of burden now that we're not requiring them to, uh, to uh, 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 submit the paperwork, um, check on, you know, hey, are you spending our money on something that um, there are private attorneys who would do free of charge to you? I also want to add that you know these are these exemptions are alternative. You know, we, in the in the context of fee shifting cases, we've been talking about whether other attorneys would take it. Um, but there's also the exemption where recovery of damage is not the principal object of the case, which could also be a basis for exemption, it, it, particularly if they think recovering in fee shifting cases is incredibly unlikely. I was going to say, so I guess I guess the question is, is it because this isn't sort of very stated very clearly in the rule, but is it your view that <clears throat> any cases brought under a fee shifting statute like are per se fee generating, or is there an opportunity for them to provide evidence that like, oh, actually given the high burden, almost no one gets their fees shifted, ergo this, we think in this category of cases, it's very unlikely to be fee generating. And ergo, it's not a fee generating case. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's anything in the rule that forecloses that. I think conceptually, um, we were, you know, thinking of these fee shifting statutes. That's that's the whole point for, for most of them that I'm aware of. If, you know, if, you, if you, you're bringing a meritorious case, you, you reasonably expect that you're gonna get fees. Um, um, I think, I think it might be a little bit, I think the answer to your question is yes. I also think that, again, this involves them with their knowledge having some sort of policy. Um, and I think that the result is probably the same either way because if, if there are cases like that where they're not gonna get fees then no lawyer is gonna, gonna give them, um, gonna take their case. For free. Oh, they, they, they may be able to qualify for multiple. I'm just curious, you know, how, right. how stringent we want to be on defining fee generating versus fee shifting. And I was just thinking about um, Mr. Smith's point about, you know, if the government doesn't have, it, it, there's fee shifting only when the government doesn't have substantial justification, right? Like that's not a, 
that's not a, a low bar, right? At right. Time. So you you could potentially see a situation where the government, you know, most of the time there's not fee shifting, even if it's a possibility. Right. Right. I just I just want to add that um, in the rule the the record maintenance like requirement applies to invocation of the exemptions. So if it if it wasn't sort of per se, you know, and then later they recovered attorney's fees, then the sort of the way the rule is written now wouldn't have the like documentation requirements. So you'd want to like bring it within the scope of fee generating cases and then require the exemption to be invoked. So we're ensure that any attorney's fees recovered are, are tracked and only used uh, as, as we require in the rule. And, you know, I mean, and maybe, maybe it would make sense to, um, you know, for consideration, are there, again, it, it's not in the rule and I, I don't know that it should be, but, um, you know, if, if, if we could find out, you know, if, if there are, you know, whole categories of, of, of um, fee shifting type cases where, where it just, it just isn't reasonably expected that, you know, even if it's a, you know, you think it's a meritorious case, you're not going to get fees. And, and, you know, um, then I, I think that would fall out of the definition, you know, based on our limited look at, at most of the fee, fee, fee shifting statutes we heard of, they seemed to be falling within that definition. Okay. Uh, Will and then Dwan. Yeah, I just want to confirm my understanding. So we have the four exceptions, one of which is four statutory exceptions, one of which has four like subcategories. We can't change those. Those are the way it is. This rule is it's not necessarily expanding, but could be interpreted as expanding the exceptions. Um, by saying a fee generating case means any case or matter which reasonably may be expected to result in a fee. And if it's unreasonable, if we're saying that, oh, we don't usually get attorney's fees on these sorts of cases, then it doesn't count as a fee generating case. And so we're actually expanding the allowable exception here um, to take that into account. Is my interpretation I mean, I don't, I mean, I think that, that that part actually existed. I think in this discussion, we're sort of clarifying that, yes, that would be a, um, you know, um, that, that, that is an, another way that cases wouldn't fall under this. Um, I, okay. I thought you were going to go with um, the, 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 the way that the statute is actually written. And I think that the key, one of the key clarifications here um, is, um, and I'm looking at your, Ma'am, can you pull up the statute language, Raul? Yeah. yeah. It's piggybacking on this um, on this um, change that the LSC made, which is, and this is the this is the um, the uh, change made uh, through the new subsection C for Rule three point six seven three. Um, that fee generating case means a case or matter that if undertaken on behalf of an indigent person by an attorney in private practice, reasonably may be expected to result in, pay, in a payment of a fee for legal services from an award to a client, comma, from public funds, comma, or from the opposing party. Um, previously, we had concerns and we understood that to mean that, um, that a, a, any any uh, payment from public funds fell under this rule, and that covered things like um, you know um, providers who are under contract with with counties to provide um, um, uh, conservatorship services to the indigent. Um, LSC interpreted the same language as saying no. Award actually modifies is modified by client, public funds, and opposing party. So it's an award from public funds, an award from the opposing party, an award from a, to a client, um, which all actually falls into an award to a client. Um, so this this actually is less restrictive uh, than we previously interpreted the statute in that respect. Um, Go ahead, Dawn. 
Uh, I can say following uh, to Brady's previous comment. So if if the like the committee is agreeable to this general framework, but we want to do a little bit more kind of investigation to see if there are categories of cases where it's not going to reasonably lead to kind of a collection of attorneys fees, then maybe we can work with Selena um, to work get get those categories of cases from um, from programs. And then in the next iteration, I, I would not suggest to roll it back to the rules committee, because if you guys are generally okay with the framework, then in the next memo to the commission, um, we would write that into the memo. I don't think you need to codify that in terms of a state bar rule, because you know, the, the it, it could be a long list. You don't want it to think that it's only exclusive of that, but I think maybe building into the memo itself, some additional guidance, and then that will have that, and the staff will know to give TA to programs that, hey, these are the categories that, you know, like it's already been pretty much pre-approved that, 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 you know, it, it applies or doesn't apply. Thanks, Dawn. And Jim? then Erica, there's a member of the public that has their hand up. Okay, let me get Jim and then um, if we could, we'll we'll take the public question. Uh, just a question or clarification on the, the fees have to be used uh, for legal services for the indigent in California. Does that mean you actually have to document what case you use it on or does it go back to the general legal services providers budget, which could cover attorney salaries or paralegals or operating funds? I mean, how restrictive is that? I, I can I can I can I can take that one breaking rule because it's part of our monitoring visit. Um, so when we go on, on monitoring visits, our fiscal team um, makes sure that there's like, you know, the funds are separately and if there's attorney cities that come back, then they roll back into the delivery of legal services for the indigent. So there is a way that our fiscal team kind of tests for that. Yeah, this is just a, this is just a, um, a clarifying change, not a, not a substantive change. Okay, so like, going to their attorney salaries or paralegal salaries, that would count, right? Oh yeah, that would count, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, um, I think we actually, um, Raul, if you've got the the, the, the the document open, I think we need to add free civil legal services to the indigent, free. Yeah. But salaries do count as long as the, those, the staff is working on delivery okay. free legal services, yes. Okay. Um, so I see Will, but I, do we still have a member of the public? We do. Have to comment. Will, do you mind if we let that person Please go? Please take them first, yes. Kim, can you can you unmute, unmute the person? Oh, hi, I, I think I'm, am I, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. we can hear you. Okay, great. So I have a question about exception um, two. Recovery of damages is not the principal object of the case. And I'm curious about whether there'll be any guidance, not codification, but just even guidance on how that will be viewed by the bar. Um, because I can see that being pretty subjective. And I'm thinking about an instance, as we know from the onset of a case, we really don't know if we'll get damages and if we do, how much they will be. And I'm thinking of just for example, a case where you're represent where you know we're representing a client and we want to keep them from being evicted, staying in their home, but they may, as a consequence at the end of the case, receive you know a substantive damage award. And so I'm wondering how that will be viewed um, by the bar. Yeah, actually, be before we comment, do you mind introducing yourself? Oh, sure. I'm sorry. I'm Lori Furstenfeld, and I'm the I'm director of legal advocacy at the Child Care Law Center, and we are a support center. Okay. Just want to, if you were willing, I just wanted to make sure we understood. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, does anybody, you know, Brady Roll, do you have any comments on Ms. Furstenfeld's um, question? And I could take a stab at own Brady. You let me know if you would um, you would be okay with this. Um, OGC would be okay with this. I, I think it's a fairly like if it was state bar staff in our office, um, it was a pretty low bar. I think a, a lot of the the cases that you all take um, as a legal aid agency would fall under that. A, a desire to help the client, a desire to help low income communities, right? Well, I, I, well I mean it's I mean that, it's it's about what the particular case is asking for. So here it's asking to um, you know order them not to be evicted. So that sounds like um, it's about what relief is being asked for. Um, so, uh, I'd be, but again, I think that um, what you're saying is is generally correct and that, that it is a, 
um, it's a, it's a matter for you to care if you can in good faith and, and reasonably characterize it the primary aim as um, um, non pecuniary relief you know the, the, the order mm -hmm. to not be evicted um, um, and that justifies it under the, the terms as, as far as I, I see it. I may have a follow up question on that point, but I'll let uh, Selena go first. <laughs> Uh, mine is just, uh, I, I think like once once this goes out to programs, after the rules revision process is complete, um, I think it would really help to make it clear, um, given all of the turnover we have with executive directors and directors of litigation, um, making it clear what, what the Trust Fund Commission determines is fee generating based on that reasonableness factor, uh, to go back to what Jim said earlier, and then what is fee generating but would be um, eligible for one of the exemptions. Because I think that's the piece that a lot of organizations will be like, is it fee generating or not? What do I need to do? Um, and it could be fee generating, but under one of the very broad exceptions where like in Gary's re region, he knows a lot of, um, there aren't enough private attorneys to take the case and they do the work to say it's actually exempt even though it's fee generating. So it's like, is it fee generating? Yes or no. And then even if it's fee generating, um, having organizations be really clear on what it's needed for the, to show they did the work for the exceptions. And um, just one really quick comment. I did talk with one organization that they do all of this work and they do the analysis of whether to take what could be a fee generating case. And it's in these very long memos. And so they don't have like a click the box to say, yes, this is fee generating. Here's exemption number, you know, E4. Um, and so it, for some organizations, they're doing the, the important work, but they don't have an easy way to show it, but that could come up in like discussions at monitoring visits. So, I, I mean, I think, I think, um, and, and we'll want more follow up from you on what, what the community views is not reasonably um, accepted, expected to find a fee. I, th I think that on the, the exceptions though, our, our thought was that the way to do it is, you know, they know their cases. So if they establish, you know, criteria and, you know, we ask about it in the monitoring visit and they say, you know, this is, this is our view on, in our market. Um, and if it's reasonable and good faith, that that's that's I think what what we're looking for and what what the what the in, intent of it is, um, and I think for the self certification to take that 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 I think it'll just be a box in the um, application, you know. So if if they've done those memos, that's great, and if if in a monitoring visit if we have a question, we can we can ask. Um, um, but but it would be a sort of a click click the box. So Dawn, do you mind if I ask my, my question? Because it's kind of related to this and then I will let you go. Um, one thing, the, the second exception, and I think um, Ms. Furstenfeld's um, question kind of triggered something for me. There's, there's no preclusion, right, for any of the LSOs to seek damages on behalf of their clients, correct? Even if they, they just have to not take any of the money, right? And so, well, yeah, that would be a yeah, that would be not not free legal, legal services. Right? You, yeah. Yes, but 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 so I don't. I, I understand this is statute, but like I don't totally understand exception two then, because so basically you're allowed to have a contingency fee or recovery of fees if it's not the principal point. Is that is that kind of what the point of exception two is? No, it's. I think it's talking about like statutory. Like if, if the case is just for injunctive relief, then um, then it then it's an exception. Can you say the question again? So if if um, it seems to me, and this is maybe just I'm misunderstanding the point of exception two, but recovery of damages is obviously not the same as recovery of fees, right? And so, um, and so I guess what I'm a little bit confused about is in a situation where you move for injunctive relief and, and you wanted recovery of damages, like, is it that you can move for injunctive relief and if there's some damages and you get paid, that's okay? Well, no, it's that, um, so first of all, this is not, this doesn't even come into play if there's not something in the cause of action that's going to give you attorney's fees, right? Right, right. 
And often those are percentages or, you know, sometimes they're hourlies or whatever, but this is for, for, you know, whatever reason saying, Hey, we're, we're really concerned here with the, um, with, with the, with the damages suits that are, all, that are fee shifting. And so this is saying, Hey, even if there's, um, you know, reasonably expected to be a, a, a suit for, um, or, or fee shifting available, um, if, if your suits really aimed at injunctive relief, not damages, then, then, then we don't count it. I actually don't really understand the reason for that exception um, myself, and there's nothing in the legislative history okay. <laughs> about it. Um, I don't know, Raul, I didn't look, a lot of this is borrowed from LSE. Um, might be interesting in the next go round if there's if, if there's some basis yeah. in the LSE statute for why they did that, um, but. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just a weird exception because it seems like. What should matter not, is. Like, the, limited to fee shifting and it right. just sounds like a weird, like you can, as long as you're not, like that somehow you could still get a contingency fee as long as it's not the main purpose. I know that's not what you're interpreting it as, but it reads a little bit like that. That's all. Anyway, that's just a side note. Uh, Dewan, sorry. Um, I was going to say um, uh, uh, the follow-up to Selena's request about kind of guidance after it's codified. Can I, can I actually um, ask that maybe Raul and Brady put together a chart or something, that guidance, so we're all really clear about it in the next go around to the commission? Because, I, you know, this, this topic was, we asked in OGC to do it because I don't think any of our staff have the expertise in terms, I mean, it's, it's very technical, it's very steeped in like being, you know, the practice of, you know, and so if, if that's, I think, I think if you guys can develop a chart in terms of categories of cases, how would we practically, and we can, the program staff can help. But the thing is like, I don't think the program staff have like the substantive knowledge to kind of develop that. You you you, you guys have to be okay with it. That's what yeah, I'm Yeah, I think the first thing will be for Raul to um, um, reach out to Selena and say, hey, you know, mm -hmm. um, what, 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 what fee shifting cases, in other words, what cases where, you know, do you have the potential for um, getting an award if you prevail? Of attorney's fees, um, you know, do you view as as in general not reasonably, where you don't you, you don't reasonably expect to get a fee, and 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 for what reason, um, and and then if if you know we could get some feedback on that, and you know, just a short explanation why they why they think that um, you know in the cases that they take under that statute they don't reasonably expect it, um, then we can review that. And then one other um, question is that I'm going to anticipate from programs is if they draft a policy, um, I think the programs are going to want guidance and like what's what's sufficient in terms of a policy. Like we say reasonable, but I think they need to like have some. I mean, they, programs want to do like want to do the right right job. We have to guide them. So if there's something that the, the two of you have, like, I think is like a reasonable standard for that, that that would help. And then the program staff can kind of work up some of the practical kind of you know. I think that. We're gonna get that question. I'm just sure of it. Yeah. Great, thanks, Juan. Selena? Well, I was actually wondering if anyone um, had public comment, because I asked a couple others um, who practice other areas of law to see if they could join. I, could, I, I haven't practiced in 15 years and I couldn't remember a lot of this. And so I didn't know if there are other members from our community who may be able to, who joined and may be able to answer some of these questions. And there's um, a, pub, uh, a hand raised. So we wanna take. Sure. Hi, uh, it's it's Gary Smith again from Legal yeah. Services of Northern California. Um, I just wanted to clarify, <clears throat> there's a misunderstanding um, about how the LSC rule actually works. And it, it, the, 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 the cases that, uh, the, that are quoted in the statute, um, those are basically, those are sort of the universe of cases that you know from which a fee generating case might arise right but lsc doesn't have any blanket it doesn't say well fee shifting cases are all fee generating or any of those others it's up to each program to determine in each case whether or not it is a fee generating case that's how we do it for LSC purposes. And, and the factors how we determine that are the factors, you know, that are in, in the rule, but it, but there's, but we make that determination. And if we, if we determine before we file a case that it is a fee generating case, then, we, and if we want to take it, we will go through the exceptions that are in the rule. But 
but but I make that determination. And there are many times, even though the case is technically or theoretically a fee shifting case, for the reasons I outlined earlier, I make the determination that it it will not reasonably be expected to result in a fee for a private attorney. So it's not a fee generating case. That's how I that's how the LSC rule works. And if I determine because it's a fee shifting case or, or for some other reason that's in the rule that it is a fee generating case, th then I'll go through and, and we want to we, we want to take it. Then I'll go through the exceptions that are in the. Uh, in the rule. So that's just a clarification. LSC, the, L, we interpret LSC's rule to just sort of lay out the universe of cases in which there may be a fee generating case, but it's up to the program to make that determination. It, and there's not an automatic determination, a threshold determination by LSC that all of these cases are necessarily fee generating cases. That's not how it works. Mr. That, that's, um, go ahead. I just had a quick question. Does LSC, when you say, you know, you sort of make the determination up front, does LSC have like factors that that look to that? Or is it is it just this reasonable expectation language? It, it's our call. And if LSC monitors us and, you know, they look at a case, they can say, well, why did you determine that this was or wasn't a fee generating case? And we have backup and documentation in our case file as to whether it is a fee generating case, why I made a determination that it is or isn't, and if it is, how we fit into one of the exemptions if we decided to go forward with it. Sorry, I think that that's very helpful. I think I'm asking a slightly different question, which is, is there any additional like regulations or like guidance that says these are the types of, this is what would qualify as a fee generating case? Not that I know of. And you okay. know, LSC comes up with all sorts of weird sub-regulatory stuff, and sometimes I see it and sometimes I don't. But I, I'm not aware of it, and LSC has never asked me about it or cited to it. Okay, that's helpful. I just wanted to get a sense. Anyway, go ahead, Brady. No, it's just, I, I mean, I think we're largely on the same page conceptually, and the, the sort of the rule we've written um, still is consistent with that. I think it probably wasn't community. It, it was asked, oh, you know, does this cover these? And um um, I, I think I think we probably shouldn't have said yes, but we should have said, you know, yes, unless it's not reasonably expected that, you know, uh, uh, that there would be a, a fee in a particular case. Yeah, um, I, I, but they're I, certainly within the universe of, of cases that this rule, um, both LSC and this one, wants you to go through the analysis for. Yes. Is there any other public members of the public? No one else has their hand raised. Okay. Um, I mean, so can I just uh, make one? I mean, there's a sort of a, a sort of hearing two different things. One, one is that that we want clear guidelines, and here's the rules, and here's here's um, here's you know what counts and what doesn't, um, um, versus more of a here's a worksheet. If we ask you, you know, can you say, can you certify that this happened? And if we ask you about it, can you, um, you know, justify your determination? And I think those are sort of two different, two different approaches. Um, and it, it 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 sounds like LSC, it's it's more the the latter that that um, that for these types of cases, each program goes makes a determination and and keeps backup for it. That's correct. Okay. Um, other questions or comments? Oh, Selena. Oh, just reflecting on what Brady just said, it seems that also um, it would depend on the, the sophistication of the program, which, which one they felt more um, ready to follow. I think that Gary's program and many others feel very confident in their ability to do this determination for everyone. Um, but I would expect some of the newest and smallest IELTS funded programs may want a little bit more guidance. Um, but yeah, I, I think that th those would definitely feel like very two different approaches. I mean, it seems to me like maybe the right approach is a sort of fairly broad rule as as it's sort of drafted. And then, you know, I mean, I sort of think we should have like an online library because we have all these 
things that we keep in memo form and we keep saying, we'll use that. And you got to go like figure out which meeting it was at. So it might be useful at some point to have a kind of a library of guidance, but it might be useful to have the chart as a reference point for kind of staff and for the organizations, just so that everyone sort of knows the table setting. I don't know, Brady Roll, does that sound like something that's feasible? I mean, I mean maybe the more simplistic, and this could could even go into the rule that, um, you know, um, you know, statute, you know, cases brought under statutes that provide for a fee to the uh, uh, prevailing party um, are considered fee shifting um, unless, unless the grantee makes a determination that, um, that fees aren't reasonably, uh, you know, that, that there's no reasonable expectation of fees in this case for attorneys in private practice, something like that. So, yeah. so it's, you know, it's simpler for the programs that, you know, don't want to go through the analysis. Hey, for these cases, I just need to make sure that there's one of these exceptions apply or for programs that, you know, are comfortable with the analysis to say, Hey, we've looked at this case and we, we don't think it's reasonable, but we're still taking it. So, so on this point, I actually have a two, two follow-up questions. One is um, somewhat similar to what you're saying, you know, some clarification on burden and also like this may be in a different rule. Sorry if I'm expanding us, but like what happens if there's a finding that they took money or they used our money on a fee shifting case? Like, like what, what's the process, right? So let's say there's a monitoring is, visit, staff says, yeah, we disagree with you. We think this was, you know, a fee generating case and you don't meet any of the exceptions or you don't have documentation. Like what, like then what happens? Is it that without documentation, you automatically lose and, you know, or without sufficient documentation, is there an appeal to the commission? Is this all laid out somewhere else? I yeah, Dawn, sorry. Okay, so I think that laid out somewhere else is the, the topic that you worked on, Erica, in terms of, I wasn't, oh, never mind, you're not meeting yet. On Friday, when you meet with your working group about like, there's a proposal for your working group about, around fiscal stuff that's related to monitoring and visit findings and what like will trigger like commission approval. So this is where that, that would go in, in terms of okay. like findings. Okay, I guess I'll get really familiar with it on tomorrow. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so that so that's the idea. It would all be sort of fiscal monitoring. That's the bucket that it would go into. Well, right? fiscal and program monitoring, but it would go, it would go under monitoring. Well, and the, the, the thing is, I wouldn't. I don't want to limit ourselves to just monitoring. There are occasional that that we, um, you know, the commission, the uh, trust fund program finds out that you know program did something required a little bit more. So it's not just monitoring. At, I would say, at, and our grant provisions provide this. Like you know, pro programs have to keep documentation consistent. If we want to, you know, question them outside of monitoring visit, which doesn't happen often, but it does happen that we, you know, the commission has a right to, and the state bar staff have a right to kind of email and request that at any given time. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a little bit, and and maybe this will be addressed in your working group, but there's a, you know, just a degree of sort of discretion in, in how things are applied. I mean, we don't want to, we don't want to be clawing back money from anybody and that's uh, you know that's happened i don't even think in that in that that case i'm thinking about we clawed back we just um we found that they were not eligible and reduced their future grants but that was for serious willful violations so it's, okay. it's really more of a um a generally more of a monitoring and, and guidance issue like hey you know either you're not showing that these cases um you know, follow this definition or, or, hey, it looks like, you know, some of these cases maybe you shouldn't be taking, so. Um, yeah. But it's cat, it's fact specific, right? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if, if there's an organization that was like taking attorney's fees and doing something really inappropriate, I mean, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna rise to the commission much sooner and I'm, I'm assuming you guys take more serious action. Okay. Um, Sounds good, thank you. Will? This has been incredibly helpful for understanding uh, uh, section E here. I didn't realize it was lifted directly from the, the statute, that last part. So I agree with Brady that clarifying language that you can either get the four exceptions, and that's just a checkbox, or you can conduct the analysis that it would be unreasonable to expect this to actually generate fees. I think that would provide a lot of clarity for programs and then they can pick their poison 
so to speak, <laughs> you know, I just want to check off the, the exception or I want to conduct an analysis. I think that's helpful. And then to Raul's earlier question about whether it should just be a bulk check or they need to keep track of individual cases. I mean, I think given the statutory specificity here, they should keep track. We should be able to pull the records on, on each case when they've made that determination because it's either a checkbox or they've already done the analysis either for themselves or for LSC. I think that's reasonable. But and I think we don't, to, we, we don't want, oh. I mean, but you're not saying like, and I think that's sort of, we would just have them in their certification to us though, not go through every case, right? But. I, yeah, I don't think that would be necessary, but it should be something at a site visit they can easily right. pull up um, that be available and that they know that they have to keep those records. But, but are you? Yeah, I don't. I don't think we have to. Is, is it, is it for each case, though, what if what if they there's like a policy for like a grouping of cases? We're fine with that, right? We're not asking for each. They'll they'll have some tracking mechanism. I'm hoping that if we do happen to pull something, that they can track back to whatever exemption it is. Yeah, someone at some point has to make a determination that it's either one of these exceptions or uh, it's unreasonable to expect that this case would be fee generating and keeping track of that shouldn't be too difficult, I, I presume. Maybe that's an unreasonable expectation. And maybe we could, um, I mean, maybe we could even have a, a temp template checklist that, you know, we could have not required to use, but um, that we could, you know, make available or in conjunction with Selena, uh, make available. That would be just something you could, if you want to follow that, oh, yeah. just put it in your case file. I, I love checklists and making it, it as easy as possible. If we could generate something like that, I think it would be very helpful um, for the community. <laughs> uh, so yeah, and Duana, I think uh, I'm comfortable with the framework to answer your long ago question. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I tend to think if there's a policy, like for example, if there's some stats that attorneys in the community don't take, you know, uh, disability recovery cases and you determine it's a disability recovery case, that, that, that's the extent of it, right? Like we don't need them to like do more, anything more burdensome than that is what I assume, right? So it's a little bit, it's a little mix, right? You, you have to make sure it's, it falls into the bucket, but once it's in the bucket, it's, it's good. So at this point, should we, uh, what, 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 what's the best path forward? You, we wanna get this prepared to go up to the commission. Is there other stuff we need to do, Brady? I mean, what do you, I could see, depending on what we hear back from the, um, the, the, the uh, community, um, either making some additions to the rule or, or not and just putting memos in and if it's, I think we're sort of agreed on what the intent here is. Um, it's just a matter of doing it. So I think it could go straight to the commission or, or it could come, come back here. I mean, it makes sense to me as, as long as there's not, my only, I guess, caveat would be unless there's something wildly different that occurs that might be worth us vetting first, but it seems to me like I'm comfortable with it going to the commission, you know, with the tweaks that we're kind of discussing. Anybody else have any, a differing view? I don't wanna, no, I'm not hearing anyone. Okay. So I guess at this point, should we, do we need to make a motion or can we just kind of- Could, you, could you vote? Because then at least when we take it to the commission, we can say that, sure. you know, you voted and then this is what happened afterwards. And this is the addition to the, the memo. Yeah. Okay. How, how do we want to phrase that, though? I mean, maybe it could be to prove it um, with, um, you know, with potential, with potential modifications or subrule guidance uh, to be included uh, in the presentation to the commission, based on further communications or further, you know, discussions with the community. That works for me. Ro, you could you, yeah, Ro, could you mock up that your motion and just include what Brady said, and then maybe you can show it with everyone before we. That would be great. 
Yeah, well, who's working on that? Is it fair to say that this is just to protect private practices? Like the legislature included this rule because they wanted to protect private practice. I, 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 maybe it's a different way of, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm usually pretty cynical, but I think it's because if there are private practice attorneys who will do this, why should we be using our money for this rather than other cases for the indigent that private practice uh, won't do you know what i'm saying yeah that's how okay. i would look at it too there's, a, more, there's, a, more there's a lot of money yeah. and why right. that if 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 people can get free services um you know from private attorneys and get their fees paid for by the other side and i'm usually more cynical um because lse used to restrict any attorney's fees awards to any of its lse recipients um so I, i'd say i'm more on the cynical end of the spectrum <laughs> Well, regardless, I guess it's it is the way it is in the statute. Brady, sorry, is this in line? I revised. Yeah, I think that's I think that's fine. Okay. From my perspective, Jim, I think you were you were you saying something? You're on mute. Uh, we're basically approving attachment A. To the memo. Yeah. Oh, could you pull up the the um the the language of the that we have right now, Ruben Crowell? Okay. You added free free civil legal services in B after the strikeout. So you got free civil legal services? Yeah. Can you make it bigger? Oh, sorry, I'm having a hard time seeing it. Show. Or maybe just show the one document. How's that? Selena, does this address most of the concerns? like our discussion, like what we're gonna do and stuff? It addresses everything I've heard. I just, I would love to hear from, um, and I already emailed Earl about this. I think we need some of our community leaders who've been litigating for a long time to think about like what types of cases will come up. And I think that's largely to, ben to benefit future um, discussions on this issue. Um, I, I really like the idea of a template that doesn't have to be used, but could help. I think, you know, as the IOLTA community expands, um, a lot of the newer organizations have not gone through this kind of um, uh, determination before. And yeah, and I just want to emphasize, you know, we talked a lot about LSE regulations, but our programs, that's only 11 of them, of the 100 and something. So the, the vast majority are not familiar with LSE regulations. Will it be possible to have that template? or checklist um, included as part of our package? Yeah. That might be ambitious. We can try oh. though. Um, the uh, June, the middle of June is the next rules co commission meeting. Cause I think that that template, um, Raul and Brady, that might be a, maybe that's 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 the, the program side. After we have your chart, then maybe the program side staff can develop that checklist. Okay. But we will try. We'll see what we can do. And uh, Duan, when when do you think this will go to the? Um, um, we it would be great to take it in June. If you if you or Raul don't think that's enough time, then we'll just we'll it'll be August. Well, I'm Raul, maybe in conjunction next week, you could get sort of a uh, um, uh, questions out to um, out to Selena that we'd like her to circulate. Yeah, I think also the momentum because there are yeah. programs that just Selena just just circulated the, the memo. Right. The people that are already thinking about it right now, so I think this would be the time. Yeah. Optimal. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Any other questions or comments, points of discussion, or should we move to the motion? Okay, doesn't look like anyone's hand is raised. So is anyone up for making the motion? I'll make the motion. I'll second. Okay. I'm sorry, who moved? Jim, Jim okay. moved, Will seconded. Yep. Great, I'll do roll call. Al Saraf? Fightmaster? Yes. Blakemore, Boschelli? Yes. Campbell? 
Yes. Galkin. Meeker. Yes. Connolly. Yes. Motion passes. Great. Thank you to Brady and Raul for putting this together and for all your work on this and for all your work that you're going to keep doing. We really appreciate it. <laughs> it's a good way to get everybody kind of um, aligned in what they're supposed to be doing. So we really appreciate all the effort. And thank you for answering all of our questions today. Um, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay. So now that we've finished that one, uh, Will, let's turn to your to your point. Sweet. Uh, I, if we have time, I have a brief presentation. Ready? Yeah. I'll go for it. Okay. Um, oh, wait. I just messed up my presentation, of course. Um, I'll start. Uh, first, I guess I'll thank Dewan and Erica for putting me on the agenda so I could uh, make myself extra uncomfortable. I don't like having to share things, but I um, I felt like this was important and uh, an opportunity to kind of do a case study with some really smart people here. Um, let's see, I got it. Let's see if I share the right one. And I had to do a slideshow because I don't know if it counts as a state power presentation unless you have a slideshow. <laughs> we are seeing your speaker notes, so I'm not sure you may want to just That's share. That's probably the wrong one. I think you need to just <laughs> share your PowerPoint, not the um, not your whole screen, because your whole screen will show everything, but there should be a way to just highlight the PowerPoint. Right. It's been a long time since I've had to do a presentation. So yeah. I appreciate everybody bearing with me. Oh, you're fine. Please be I've gentle. Had to do, I've had to do a few virtual depots. So I have some experience with not sharing my whole screen and being like, here's my outline for all the questions. <laughs> okay, let's try again. I have the slideshow up. I'm going to select this one. And there we go. Yeah, Perfect. that's right. Great. Hey, everybody. So yeah, thank yous. Um, my intention is to just share this as a case study, put my painful experience to good use. And I appreciate everybody sticking around to hear about this uh, less than perfect uh, kind of uh, experience, travel, odyssey. Uh, but my hope is at the end, uh, we can kind of have a discussion and maybe there's some ideas from all of the experts in the room, including staff, obviously, on what we might do to address from our position, you know, to address some of the uh, less than ideal circumstances I encountered. I'm not trying to call out any particular organizations, so I'm going to be vague in some of the details, um, but I... Uh, uh, want to try and go to in, into it enough where it's uh, helpful. So in February, I had a realization that I had a legal issue and, and that I was going to need some help. And so I started at the, the state, uh, state self-help website, which was really helpful. Um, it doesn't answer specific questions, but it was awesome for like working, explaining the process. That was very, that was very cool. Um, but I, know the importance of in-person assistance was going to have specific questions. So I decided I needed to go to court self-help. Um, unfortunately, they're only in town once a month. Um, and so I had to wait. Uh, and this is probably a good time to mention some of uh, the constraints, local constraints that afflict uh, my situation. I am far away from services. It's a small town, about 5,000 people. The courthouse is open three hours a month in the, in the town. And the nearest courthouse that's open daily is a round trip, four and a half hour drive. And the nearest legal aid office open twice weekly is about six hour drive round trip. So it's, a, it's far from the in-person resources, even though I really believe that that's the best way to try and get some legal help. 
So it's what we might call a legal aid desert here. We have six weed shops, zero grocery stores, zero dentists, and like a one midnight train. Uh, but I went in and she, uh, the self-help staff after we had a wait was excellent. They're really kind, but it was a lot. Uh, and I, I got, as I started to work through the paper, paperwork, I got the sinking feeling um, in that half inch thick um, packet of paper she handed me that I was gonna be way over my head. I was gonna need help. So I went to the lawhelpca.org website, which uh, just got a revision. It looks really beautiful now. Back then, uh, back two months ago, it looked like it was from the 90s, which, you know, nostalgia and all, but not, not ideal. But ultimately, it's just a big directory of providers. Uh, it's a list. And you can filter the list down to your area of law, but it doesn't tell you where to start. You get the list and, you know, I know I don't need to start with the appellate services, but somebody else would be pretty clueless. Um, so I took the list uh, and, and got started, but it was an overwhelming starting point. Going there and feeling like, oh gosh, where do I go? Um, quick aside, I know that uh, legal aid organizations can't help everybody. They have limited resources, but I still wanted to do my best to reach out and get the help if it was available. So the first agency I found, they had an online application, really excellent. I can fill it out on my own time. I submitted it. They gave me a confirmation page. Two to three days, they will call me and I better answer within three calls or they will give up and I need to reapply. It's not ideal, but I, I submitted it and I was on, on the wait. While I was waiting, I started to call. Uh, I wanted to call the next organization on the list. Called in at 10 a.m. Um, and they had an automated system. I was 14th in the queue. And I'm like, okay, I can do that. And uh, as I was waiting, I uh, continued to search through their website to see what kind of services they provided and how it worked. And I discovered that they also had an online application to schedule an appointment for that day. So I filled it out, scheduled an appointment, and I was about to hang up on hold. And I was like, oh gosh, you know, what if they don't call? Uh, Cause I've had some poor experiences in the past where there's not the follow through. So I didn't hang up, I stayed on hold. I kind of went on my, uh, about my day uh, listening to the saxophone solo on repeat, uh, but the, the cue number kept going down. Um, and after about three hours on hold, my appointment time came around and unfortunately I did not get any call. There was nothing, uh, but I had moved up in, in the line. So I was still hopeful that I was gonna get to talk to somebody. Um, but then five hours, I'm still on hold. Um, and I'm feeling pretty bad, you know, at that point I, I wanted to just hang up, but I'm kind of desperate for some help. So I'm like, well, if I hang up, I might just call up and be on hold with somebody else. So I'm going to stay on hold. And 45 minutes after that, they, they de answered, um, and I explained the issue and they said, well, we'll check to see if there are any appointments available and um, there were not. So five hours and 45 minutes to be told, no, no, we can't help you. But she did refer me to, uh, um, to the first place that I had applied to already. And then kind of strangely to me, to the court departments, she gave me the phone numbers for the court departments. I, I didn't understand it, but it was, at least it was something. Uh, and I was, but I was feeling pretty dumb after five hours to 45 minutes, but she said I could call back. And so I asked, well, is, you know, five hours a usual wait? And she said, yes, but I could still call back and wait to uh, get some assistance. And it's like, okay, well, <laughs> that's a pretty defeating, but I, um, it's like, <laughs> sorry. I um, didn't, I didn't want to call back. Uh, I was uh, feeling frustrated at that point and defeated. And I, I just felt like, you know, it's okay to say no, 
but I would just prefer you to do it quickly. Um, I did reach out. I did reach out to them in my personal capacity and say, "Hey, it would be great if you didn't make people wait on hold for so long." Um, but and and they were responsive and they 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 um, apologized and said that they would address it. Uh, but I also felt bad for you know those ten people in front of me who also had to wait because for me to have to wait that so long <laughs> meant that there were other people really desperate for help and willing to sit on hold. So um, I expressed that, but I thought I would try a, a, a different organization, go back to, uh, oh no, the other one in the, in the county there. And uh, they had a broken website. So I was kind of worried they had gone out of business. Uh, I, especially I called them during business hours and they were like, please leave a message in our voicemail box and then it went to the voicemail box and it's like the voicemail box you've reached is full so you can't leave a message so i was like oh geez but i did i called them back the the next day and they did answer wasn't awake but they only do in-person assistance so if i could get the 215 miles to their clinic i could uh, get help it's about three and a half hours one way um I was uh, a little defeating and she tried to help out a little bit, but she, she just didn't know. So it was a positive in that it was a, a quick rejection, but um, you know, left me a little, a little more defeated. And then I, I tried the lawyer referral service, but of course you call them and you get the message. They're impacted by a staff shortage. They won't be able to call back for a couple of days. Please leave a message. And, and I did, uh, they did eventually call me back, but I heard, after I'd already tried somebody else. Um, and so I know you're, you're probably getting the picture, right? Like it's, um, it's frustrating, but I wanted to share uh, this, this last part because I think the quantity of obstacles matters and it contributes to the poverty trap. Um, in a totally unrelated example, I was trying to get some Medi-Cal help a couple of days ago and I, I had to give up after seven phone calls where each person says, oh, you need to call these people. And they're like, well, I don't know why they told you to call us. We can't do anything about that. And it just, it adds up. Um, so I, I went to the, back to the first organization. I had submitted an application to on Monday. It was Thursday and I called and she, it was the, the phone wait wasn't too long, but she said the website was wrong. They didn't have a two to three day response time. It's two to three weeks. And I was going to have to wait. Um, but I don't know if it's because I sounded sad, but she uh, took pity on me and she said, no, no, you know what? We'll have somebody call you back after 1.30 and they can do the eligibility, eligibility intake and survey. And uh, after everything that had come before, I cannot express to you how relieved I felt in that moment that, okay, finally I'm, I'm getting to the next step. Um, of course they never called. Um, they never called back. Um, I think they called back the next week and I missed a call, but they didn't leave a message or any callback information. It was uh, just, they disappeared. So then I went to the, the, uh, the other organization where um, they were, able to help and connect me with a couple of attorneys. I did get a call back, but I'm actually, um, I'm still waiting. They, they uh, <laughs> starting in, I guess, really March, but or, yeah, I am still waiting. They said last week that they would be able to help me out last week, but then they got busy and now they're supposed to call me this week. Uh, they, they have another day, we'll see, but um, at least they've been able to answer some of my more critical questions. And if they can't connect with me, I, I will go it alone, right? And I think that's what I wanna emphasize, right? I, I don't believe that I'm entitled to assistance. They don't have to serve everybody. Um, but I, I do believe that there's a important element of human dignity that comes up when you don't respond or you make it really difficult to get past that um, first, just get in the door, 
right? Whether it's in a, having to wait in a waiting room where they have the glass and they're like, oh, we can't tell you anything. You just have to wait. Or it's trying to get a hold of somebody on the phone when you're hundreds of miles away from their office. And if they had said, you know, nope, you're on your own really quickly, it would have been upsetting. And I was still probably gone out and try and found a, an attorney who would take pity on me and help me out or maybe hit up a neighboring county uh, QSP. Uh, or I would have said, okay, I'm just gonna go it alone. But um, I've had enough bad experiences with state bureaucracies where going it alone on important legal issues is pretty scary. So I, I continued to try. Um, so I said at the beginning, I wanted to share this experience as kind of a case study and then tap into the feedback from the experts in the room on uh, are there any ways we might be able to address the issues I encountered? Because it is really defeating. And I am on this commission. I work with people. I believe in this mission of legal aid. I cannot imagine how it feels for people who don't, don't get clued into the system, don't understand how it works and aren't feeling persistent, right? Like if, that they, they have to know that they have to keep pounding on the door if they wanna get help because otherwise they're not going to. And I think that's a less than ideal and ultimately harmful way of providing service. Um, but we have an opportunity, right? Like my pain grants this opportunity to share this perspective with all of you and say, how can we do better? How can we encourage those folks who receive our grants to, to funnel people? Or how can we um, funnel people to the appropriate resources, right? Or communicate quickly that they're on their own, right? Sorry, you aren't gonna get any help, but um, at least you know, and you're not left with this feeling of uh, hopelessness that comes with just, are they gonna help? I don't know, I hope maybe, I don't know. Maybe if I called these other people and it's, I can't, you know, when I lived in Los Angeles, at least I could show up at the door or I could go to the courthouse or I could go to the clinic. And so you could be there face to face. But out here in the boonies, I had no idea the level of difficulty until I had to go through it. And I felt like it would be important to share that, get feedback and maybe start the conversation and see if there's anything we can do to help just bridge that gap for folks who, who are far away or who don't know. And, and um, in so doing, kind of restore that, that feeling of human dignity and giving people hope, ideally, right? We're not gonna fix everything right now, but the, every little bit, that you can move towards that goal, I think is a worthwhile effort. And um, thank you to everyone who um, has listened to my story and I appreciate it. Done, see, we're all over. <laughs> Thanks guys. Yeah, so Will, thank you so much for being willing to like share those, like that personal experience with us. Cause I, I do, I do think it's, hard sometimes for us to appreciate like what that kind of on the ground, you know, experience is. I mean, like I've done like, you know, clinics and tried to do some pro bono work on the, but I've always been in an urban environment and, you know, obviously it's, it's really helpful to know, you know, that there's like this administrative, administrative time tax, right. That's sort of a big, you know, issue of how people who don't have the resources just just their time becomes like currency that they have to pay in order to get things that they're entitled to or to get help, right? So I really am grateful that you were willing to kind of share that with us. And I wanna, um, you know, I wanna kind of think through what are different ways in which, cause we are an oversight body, right? What are ways in which we can help with like that quality control problem? Right. And, you know, obviously we want to be sympathetic to our organizations, given that, you know, there's funding issues and stuff with them, but like, what is it that we can do? And so I'm going to open it up to, to the rest of the rules committee, but, you know, I, I'm also sort of thinking about whether it's, 
more specific questions in the discretionary grants, you know, like, do you have wait times, right? Like, what, what's your feedback, that kind of thing, where we can be a little bit more um, specific about some of these, like, potential pitfalls to, to kind of, you know, there's the whole adage, right? What gets measured gets mad managed, right? And so there may be a way to kind of push it in that direction, but that may not be enough. So I, I, I'm just sort of throwing out a couple of like, you know, some ideas of what we can do, but let me see. So Louise, you have your hand up. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm not sure you're comfortable answering this question, Will, but I am curious as to what area of law you're having this problem in. Fam family law. Okay. And it um, adds that emotional dynamic, which I did not realize how much that would gut punch me, but go on. Well, the reason I was asking is because I think some areas of the law have a lot less uh, services. Family law, however, as far as I'm concerned, has a lot of services. Um, I was the family law facilitator in our county for a long period of time in Sonoma County, which is not a big county, not a small county. Um, so I'm kind of horrified to hear your story because I know how hard it is. I worked with people like this, you know, and I, I worked for actually Legal Services Corporation many, many years ago. So um, now that I know what area you're in, I, I'm really, I hope somebody has some ideas because there definitely should be, like in our county, we deal with people outside our county by phone or Zoom or however we can. I mean, there's a way to communicate with people who li live out, you know, out of the major metropolitan areas um, and give them services via, you know, the internet and the, you know, whatever other resources are available. So I'm kind of befuddled and angry at what you've had to go through. <laughs> but thank you for sharing that. Thank you. I, I, I know there are resources out there. It's just, I haven't, you know, I've I've I found one, and hopefully they'll respond. But the other ones, that's that's part of the battle is finding. Them. So there's no what yeah. county? Do you mind saying what county you're in? I I prefer not on the Maybe record here. Um, I don't because I, I, I don't I don't want to call anybody out. No, um, I, I understand. I, but yeah. um, I mean, there are should be self help access in every county in California. And maybe the Judicial Council is the place to find out, you know, who services your county. They, she, she said, um, the self-help person who comes to town, um, she was very helpful, but she couldn't answer the specific questions and, and worries. And so then I, then it's outside of that uh, well, I guess. But was she an attorney or a paralegal? Do you know her status? I, I don't, yeah. They, and then the county's all very, in fact, in the county I worked in, we were, we were not supposed to give legal advice. Well, how do you define legal advice? You know, and I right. have, I always <laughs> defined it as something I would not tell the person if the other person was sitting in the room. That would be more like, you know, strategy. Uh, but a lot of legal information, you know, like what the law says and stuff like that, can be disseminated, but a lot of people are, have rules that you can't do that. And then you may be running into that roadblock too. So, sorry, <laughs> I just, I, I really feel bad for you. <laughs> Thanks, Louise. Uh, Duan and then Vanetta. Yeah, you know, one idea I had, and I did share this with Will already um, recently, um, was, you know, at least in the purview of the rules committee, there is a topic that uh, by design, that's a little bit of a catch all topic that we're saving towards for next year when we're kind of winding down the rules committee work um, that's grants administration. Um, and what we were imagining in that is kind of like, um, Erica, you're working on the fiscal compliance piece, but then the program compliance piece. And there is a, a like a, a guidance, it's not a checklist that we use when we want monitoring visits, but um, there is guidance, right? For what the staff can inquire about, um, the commission is welcome to, or the rules committee is welcome as part of that topic to look at that, that, that guidance piece and see if we want to add things to it. We do have to actually think about our, our monitoring visit at some point in the next year or two, because the way our monitoring visit was designed previously was really just to get at IELTS and EEF funding. We've now, because of all the additional streams of funding that we, 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 we get, we tack on. So say um, they get a bank, a bank grant, we do like one, um, 
a, another uh, like a uh, an interview with a big grant like staff. The HP we do one, but, but we definitely should should run by the commission and EBR and all the various um, sub entities to see actually how you want to do that monitoring for the program side. It's become very fiscally heavy heavy. Um, and then because of all the grants, do we need to start moving to like a two day visit? Um, or do we want to stay with the one? Uh, we used to all do it like um, in person, the pandemic, we've done it remotely. So I think we want to actually move to a hybrid model where um, the programs that need more, a little bit more heavy monitoring than we go in person. Otherwise, say you haven't had a finding in maybe two visits or whatever that barometer is, maybe we keep it at, at, as a, um, a remote. So we, we, do, we do need to customize it a little bit. And that is something that I think would be part of the grants administration. And then part of this is maybe, um, this is client satisfaction, wait time issue. And then um, if we can then pass that information along, Eric, I really like the idea about um, in the discretionary grant realm, because, you know, I also an EF, the way it's designed, I agree with this, right? Stable funding, we're not trying to, we, we want to give programs some assurance that they're going to get in, plus we don't have a statutory authority, right? Programs eligible, they just get it. But I think in the discretionary grant, it's competitive, right? So if you are not providing, it's a customer service base, base delivery service. So if you're not meeting those, then maybe maybe you should not get additional grant funding from us in terms of discretionary grants. Um, but so so that's something I think we could do in terms of like as a rules committee. Um, and that's that's my thoughts. Thanks, Tuan. Vanetta? Oh, Vanetta, sorry, you're still on mute. I just want to <laughs> catch you before. Calls you. are not too much in noise, but I think I can so at least resonate with that component of we're talking about major systems issues, right? <clears throat> and difficulties in navigating these systems and organizations have responsibility to, as you're saying, customer service. Mm -hmm. if, they, if they have the proper infrastructure and training and logistical the bandwidth, <clears throat> then they can navigate this themselves. But my, my thought is that they may not have that bandwidth because they're just trying to function but not assessing the, the quality of their services. And so in terms of um, the role that perhaps we can play is looking at um, asking questions around the logistical uh, infrastructure, their capabilities, kind of strengths and, and, and growth areas, and try to factor that into additional training or support. Um, the other part is you were talking about, you know, we're talking about working with indigent clients and they're already feeling very vulnerable that they don't have a voice. And they're, they may not be able to wait one hour. You know, they, they may not have the, the resources to do that. And so I think that your story is, it's really abominable, but it speaks to service delivery as part of getting access. And that's one thing that seems to be lacking, so. And then you kind of cut off on the the last part, but I think I think we hopefully got got the the point, which I think is a really good one about kind of focusing on on organizations' infrastructure mm -hmm. and their ability to deal with this. And obviously, also the rural component is quite big too. I know when we did some discretion, I did some discretionary grant. There were you know suggestions of satellite you know visits. And maybe we need to like emphasize that more, right? Or provide more points if they're higher, you know, if there's more frequency or something. Anyway, um, Jim and then Selena. Yeah, I was just going to say, well, the uh, Access to Justice Commission first addressed the problems of rural access back in 2010. Its report, it was about three years to write that report. And we good report. Purposes, pur there were two major purposes. One is to define the problems of rural access, and two, to come up with a non-arbitrary quantitative way to define rural areas. Since we have very large counties in this state, which have urban as well as rural areas like, like San Bernardino. Um, and we also put an explicit plea at the time, I was not on the access to, uh, I was not on the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission in 2010, but we put a specific request to this commission about trying to fund more rural access. And through the years, and I know through the lobbying uh, with Selena and Lack, they've been successful at getting rural components in some of the discretionary grants, in particular, the homeless prevention grants. Uh, I think homeless prevention grants two, three, and four, all the competitive grants all had a homeless 
uh, had a rural element in it so that those agencies that were writing these discretionary grants that had a rural component were rated higher. Now, your experience just goes to show <laughs> it hasn't solved the problem. The problem is still there. And it also shows it took a, like a 10 year effort to start getting money allocated on the basis of rural issues. And also when we were defined, when we were discussing, I guess it was two years ago on the eligibility issues on, and on the, uh, the funding formula, whether or not to use 125% or the 200% of the poor, this commission did the analysis to show that if you use a 200% eligibility level for um, uh, defining the clients for the funding formula, that would significantly shift money from the rural areas to the urban areas. And so that the legislation then was changed so that clients eligibility was based on the 200%, but the funding formula was based on the 125 specifically to preserve more funding for rural areas. So there have been efforts. Obviously there needs to be more. Thanks, Jim. That's really good context. Um, yeah, everything's so slow moving when you're dealing with like the legal world at times, right? <laughs> We're trying our best though. But we, 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 I, Will, I appreciate you bringing this up because I think there are ways that we can get creative to try to address the issue. Go ahead, Selena. Well, I, well, I'm just really sorry that this has happened to you. Like every time you interact with a corporation and you're put on hold, you just feel like they don't care about you as, as an individual, as a human being. And it's, it's frustrating when our legal aid community unintentionally communicates that message that like a five hour whole time, five hours and 40 minutes, that seems completely ridiculous. Um, and I, I, I feel like there's a piece here that like erodes public trust in legal aid generally, if, if you didn't, you know, you were the person who, who is persevering, who is like trying multiple options, who goes to law help, which does work better now, um, and, and like tries all these methods to get actual legal help. Um, and most people I think would give up before that they would try a couple different numbers, they go to a couple websites and they give up and so the next time anyone in their community asks for help, they'd say oh don't go to legal aid, they don't help. Um, and so that's a piece that like your individual experience um, is, is really demonstrating what, what is a bigger problem that the communities won't trust legal aid and won't go to legal aid even if it's an issue that legal aid is the perfect solution because it's a you know an eviction notice and legal aid's fact on that. Um, because there's like complete lack of trust in, in responding. But um, uh, you know, on the issue of family law, I think the family law facilitators are actually still probably the best um, service providers right now because they're in every county. Um, and they do provide a lot of really great legal information, but it's really hard when they're only open three hours a month. And that's, you know, that's a court funding issue and why we always try to get more court funding. But I'm sorry, I, it, it is not fair and it is not, um, not what we would want anyone in legal crisis to, to face. Can I, add, can I add one more thing? Yeah, uh, please, of course. If you go to the Judicial Council website, there is an awful lot of information about forms, how to fill them out, where to get help, you know, your rights. Um, so I just thought I'd throw that out for you too. I don't know if you've been on there. Uh, yeah, it's. I think it's great. It's an excellent resource. I think what I you know, didn't expect is how um, I have a really hard time thinking clearly on this matter that I run into like, oh, oh, how should I, I don't even know how I should ask this. And I, um, I, uh, I just didn't expect that part, right? Where it would be uh, so challenging. Whereas like with my, when I had to deal with a UD issue, you know, it's emotional, it's fraught, but I'm like, oh, we got to get it done, gung ho, we're going all the way. And it was, it was, uh, it felt a little easier in some ways uh, than, than this sort of thing. Um, and, and I guess I'll, I'll respond briefly to a couple of remarks because I, I really appreciate, um, I appreciate the remarks. And I can't imagine folks who have it worse than I do. Uh, you know, I am, I can persevere because I know that there's this group that's working really hard. And I feel like everybody I spoke to cared. They were just doing the best they could to, in a bad situation. Even the, the person who was like, hey, is it normal to wait five hours and 45 minutes? You know, 
obviously she, she's trying to get through her day just like I am. And they're doing their best. And so I, Vanetta, when you said, maybe they just don't have the infrastructure to, to implement good systems. I think that really resonates with me. Like, how do we empower them? Is it the, the monitoring visit or is it, we ask them to say, how many calls are you getting a month? Because one thing like the client satisfaction surveys will never catch is the people who give up. Because I will tell you, if, if the current QLSP actually ends up helping me get all this documentation gun, done, they're getting fives. Everything was great because I will be so grateful that it, they could help me. Um, but it's the people who, who give up, who, who can't get through on the phone or who, who never get a call back. And because they're just, they, they have the pile on of like everybody needs help, they can't get back to them. And so maybe it's, it's just how many calls are you getting? How many can you respond to? And that not even to penalize them, but to get a better sense of what the need is. And, and there's, a, there's also a financial advantage if the first group, you know, can, if, uh, if they're not having to call everybody, because that's one less phone call you have to answer, one less um, application you have to, but right now it's the shotgun approach. You got to call everybody up and hit up everybody, hoping that one of them says yes. Um, so, and, and I, I did read part of that report, uh, Jim, and it was really great. It was helpful in understanding the difference between rural urban. And I think it's great. And some of the suggestions in there are recommendations. I'm like, oh gosh, how do we keep moving forward on those? Because there are folks who don't have this access. So however I can, I don't know what the next step is. Waiting a year, uh, it would be disappointing to me. I don't know if it's if we can have a further conversation or if I can work with so, staff or I yeah. don't know what happens next. Yeah. So Will, actually, this is a good question. I guess one of my questions back to you is like, what would you like to see us do? Like, what are what are some of the things that you think we can do to, you know, you, you've been on the commission for a few years now. We've been sort of throwing out random ideas, but I'm curious if you have like um some proposals that you would like us to 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 work through and, and try to consider if not that's fine i just wanted to make sure i gave you that opportunity on the client side like how i feel it should work sure i have ideas like don't make people wait a long time very quickly say no uh warm referrals should are the golden standard right like that's easy but what i wanted to lean on this group for was like how would we collaborate with legal aid organizations to encourage that outcome, those outcomes, right? I don't know. I don't have a, any ideas really on that other than, well, we can increase reporting in some areas. Maybe we can do some creative reporting, especially on the discretionary grants where we, we, we get to set the rules. That might be a great area. Uh, I don't know what exactly where our jurisdiction, what kind of, you know, is this a professional standard that legal organizations should meet? I, I, I don't know. Um, but that's where I, I wanted to lean on this group because if there are, and, and could start the conversation because if maybe you guys have the answers and I, I just have the experience and say, well, will that result in shorter wait times or will that result in quicker, answers or or even just who should I call first is overwhelming. When I get seven organizations on the legal help website, it's like, which one do I start with? Do I start with all of them? Okay. <laughs> like that step-by-step -step could be helpful. Got it. So I feel like it sounds like there's a couple of different issues that we could kind of highlight and focus on. One is I think an outreach and like publicity element, right? Um, and, you know, obviously we have as an organization, or we mainly just hold the purse strings and then sort of regulate on the purse strings, which is very powerful, but we're not like, at least I'll confirm with Dwan, but we're not like the bar where we can do necessarily like a professional responsibility type of, um, regulation. Dwan, am I correct on that? Well, the state bar regulates attorneys, but the purview of the commission doesn't regulate like 
I mean, you, you're regulating, I guess, in a way, like the organization through this codification process and all the rules. And but um, if it's a kind of professional like responsibility rule or something like the model rules of that that goes to a different office and at the state bar, the office of professional um, conduct. Okay, I guess more generally. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Louise. Oh, you're still on mute. Sorry. Uh, since Bonnie House retired, um, I, we do have a representative from the Judicial Council, correct? Dawn, you're I don't on know if Melanie's still on. Melanie and Laura are the, the Judicial Council liaisons. Um, because that's another, that's an avenue for discussion. I mean, I, I know, I did, I do know uh, Melanie, I've known her forever, but um, because that's a road, road into that access um, funding, that kind of thing from their perspective. Yeah. I mean, as far as setting best practices for their um, or even like minimum thresholds for their like the organization's um, uh, conduct, for lack of a better term, I do we do we have that authority? I'm, I I want to sort of ping Dewan and Brady on that. Is that something that we we have that ability to to? I I'm, I'm with you, Will. I don't want to penalize people, but like to try to like get, right. you know, get some of these issues, like at least out in the open. Right, I don't understand the question, the authority for, for, for what exactly, sorry. Well, so it's clear that, you know, we have authority to kind of evaluate their fiscal, you know, um, situations, right? And like determine that they're using the money in an appropriate way. You had pointed out that in the monitoring visits, there's a sort of other angle, which is like their their um, operations, I guess. Yeah, well, I think you could fit in our internal controls, which is a statutory requirement. Oh. They, have, they have to have, um, I can't remember what the phrasing is like, satisfactory internal controls, reasonable, some, there's something attached to that. Quality, like, quality, quality through. control procedures, quality, I think. Quality, there, exactly. And we use okay. the APA quality standard. Internal controls. And which so that's how we get this. all the monitoring visit stuff. And then there's state bar rule that says like, um, they um, need to, what we use for monitoring is the ABA um, standards of, of, ABA model standards rules, I'm paraphrasing kind of a thing. So presumably you could have another rule that references either something else or you guys create another rule that gives additional guidance in terms of like conduct, but that's, yeah, that, that, that's the codification process though. Okay, yeah. I mean, that sounds like one way that we could, and I, I know, Will, this isn't very satisfactory that it's, it may take a while to kind of like run this well, through. I, I, <laughs> I'm not expecting a solution today. No, no, no sure. but, but I, but I think sort of when we get into that that particular rule, like I think keeping this in mind would be really helpful. The other thing I was thinking is, I know, and I think Will, you were on this working group about the complaints procedures and that kind of stuff. And you know, I don't know what the status of complaints has been, but you know, and I don't, I'm not necessarily, but. If there's a way in which, whether it's through complaints or through surveys, we could get more information about, you know, how prevalent this kind of a problem is, um, whether that's, and I, I, I'm not sure if that's something we can do sort of through our rules or officially, or, you know, if there's a way, but that might be, to your point, like, if we're not capturing what's sort of happening. We don't even know how to fix that problem, right? You're, you know, your story is, is, is very helpful in giving us a window into it but like it's also helpful to know is it like anecdata or is it like this is statistically an overwhelming experience for people and and in where right is it you know are all the urban folks able to get in in the rural or not and so that can help us kind of with addressing it it sounds like the access commission's done some really great work on this so i don't want to double up on them but there it, that would be a, a really i think important way to get at it is to have some way in which we can let people come tell us so that we know, right, what's happening. But I, I don't know, Selena, do you, or, or Vanetta, your, your hands up, and then I would love to hear if Selena has views on this. I don't want to overburden everybody either. Yeah. Go ahead, Vanetta. No, I was just going to say, the first thing that comes up is if the organization did a needs assessment. That's really what we're talking about, right? You know, a needs assessment of their, their yes. structure, their functions, and so Wait, forth. Right. And that's a way of building. Um, it's kind of like having a, a training emphasis as opposed to one being punitive. Yes. Because if they can yes. look at their own limitations and they can come up with ideas as well. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Like keeping the focus on helping to like 
build the infrastructure for these organizations rather than being like, well, we're just going to starve you until you get better, right? <laughs> like, that isn't helpful. At least uh, start there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Duan, go ahead. Yeah. So one thing we want to do is something more um, a quicker, but that's not like a requirement. But we are at, at the suggestion of this, I think it's this committee or another committee. Um, the State Bar staff is doing like a training around um, some of the compliance issues that have like surface and monitoring visit. One thing we can add a couple slides just saying like, don't forget about like client satisfaction. Um, you might want to do a needs assessment. These are things you might want to do without going to the codification and getting commission approval. Yes. We can't really require at this point, but we can say these are things that you would, would want to consider. And the commission is going to be looking at this most more closely in codification. Um, if in the meantime, if you need technical assistance, please either come to us or come to LAC for, for, awesome. for like but more of the one-on-one. -on -one. Thanks, Juan. Those are great ideas. Selena, go ahead. I mean, I was just going to basically say the same thing as I think the state bar staff can do really great technical assistance on this issue. Um, even popping up a standalone, sorry, everybody's moving, <laughs> even popping up, a, I'm trying to look at you, Erica, um, even popping up like a standalone, um, like Zoom about best practices and in client intake online and by phone. Um, there has been a lot of attention in the national um, in the national legal services world um, on intake and you know, equal justice conferences next week. A lot of organizations are presenting on intake, and there's a lot of attention also on like client feedback via text. But that assumes that they got through the door and got representation. Um, and I know there's a lot of organizations that have really great hotlines that that do track things like their whole time. And some of those organizations could present in an informal, you know, state bar TA around here are organizations who figured it out. Um, and I think it's important for our community to hear like this is all about community trust. It's not is your wait time 20 minutes versus 19 minutes. It's what does a community believe about you because of your responsiveness. And um, I can't remember who it was, but somebody was saying years ago that like, um, I, this may have been in the context of the justice gap study when we were designing it. So maybe it was Jim, um, but talking about if someone doesn't go to legal aid, then we don't know that we haven't served them because they, they don't go to legal aid. So they don't get an intake system. They don't even get on the call, but because it, it's like an upstream problem. Um, and I don't know if we'll, how, how hard it will be to measure that except for through the justice gap study, but organizations should have a sense of how long people are waiting on hold. That, that feels like a data point. Yeah. And maybe how many hangups. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I inspired a, a few ideas there because a lot of new telephone systems, they track that, right? It's, and it would be really easy for them to pull that report. And just by pulling the report, maybe they realize that there's a, a problem and we can encourage change that way. Um, other things that, I, that came up was, you know, out of date websites, the one organization I went to that hadn't been updated from 20, since 2021 and their website, had broken links and all of that. And I was like, I, actually, I went into Smart Simple to make sure we hadn't stopped funding them because I was like, well, I don't wanna waste my time if they're, they're defunct, but we were. And I was like, okay. Um, <laughs> and also remote services for, for rural people, like either text or, or frontier, I've learned a new term, frontier, based on that, that report that Jim was talking about, the, front, the MSS, MSSA. Um, frontier, rural, urban. And, you know, if, if they don't provide remote services and I know I'm 200 miles away from them, well, I don't want to, you know, if we could clarify that and make it its own distinction, that helps in me not wasting my time and also not wasting their time because all they're doing is saying, oh, we can't help. You. Just like on that long wait time, if they had had somebody who could answer the phone and say, just say, oh, we can't help you in that area of law, please call back on Thursday, right? Even that, it helps build the trust and makes you feel like a human being, right? Those sorts of things that you really have to think about. And I don't know how to encourage those things, but there are small things that really matter when you're trying, trying yeah. to get some help. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Jim and then Selena. Uh, Jim, you're still on mute. Sorry. I was just going to ask Selena, do you know if they're planning on doing another justice gap study? And if they are, are they going to specifically look at rural versus urban areas? 
I should probably answer that. Selena, yeah. it's, not, it's, not, it's not Selena that does justice gap study. Jim, it's the state bar staff, and Erica is actually the point person on it. If you want to, if you want a, a, a brief update on that, so they are doing another one. Well, they as an us, yes, us. <laughs> you guys are okay, yes. but uh, is 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 the rule issue going to be specifically addressed? Are they going to sample rural areas? Erica, do you want to do you want to take that? Sure. Um... We're kind of still in the initial planning stages, so we're gathering kind of our ideas about what needs to be covered in the next iteration, but we haven't made any final decisions yet. So that is one of the topics that we're considering including, but it's obviously gonna be subject to um, kind of whatever restraints we might have on, on you know all the topics that we can cover uh, within a limited amount of time. So it's on the table. Okay. Thank you. Selena? Um, I was actually curious, are any state bar staff going to Equal Justice Conference next week? We can't because it's in Texas. We're not, we're prohibited from going. Oh yeah, I got it, sorry. Um, well, I'm, I'm going, um, it's my home state and I'm gonna see my mom while I'm there. But um, there are two sessions that actually look really good. Um, I will send, Dwan, I'll send you the link to those two sessions because one of them is um, Legal Services Alabama and the other one is, um, Legal services, legal aid services of Northeastern Minnesota. Um, and they both looked at all of their intake systems with a client-centered model of, um, of looking to see, you know, in person, online, and phone to figure out how they could be more welcoming in particular. So I'll send you the links to those. Um, okay. maybe maybe I send it out. Yeah, maybe even asking like how their if their state yeah. bar is involved might be helpful. Thank you, Selena. Great. Awesome. Well, it sounds like we have at least some you know, kind of initial thoughts and ideas doing, you know, the, the presentation and adding kind of customer service as a talking point with the LSOs, um, adding this to the rules committee topic on monitoring visits for next year. Um, you know, I think your point about kind of the small fixes, small, I say small, but it may not actually be small for the organization, but like keeping your stuff up to date, maybe maybe posting like who's available on what schedule, right? You know, and, and sort of sticking to that or having ongoing updates online that say like our person's out today, so don't call, right? Or they're not coming in until Thursday, right? Something that's a little bit, you know, basically, uh, you know, sort of someone who's responsible for kind of updating real time. Um, those may be good, you know, suggestions that we can like encourage based on the, the feedback here. And then longer term, you know, we can kind of try to build these into, um, you know, actual like standards for monitoring and thinking about how we can get information from the communities that we're trying to serve so that they also have, we're also hearing from them, not just the organizations, right? Um, yeah, I think those are excellent things. And if you or Dewan have suggestions on how I can uh, help contribute or push that forward. I'm, I'm glad to give suggestions and point out areas where it might be worth exploring or or even Selena, I guess, because you have the, the website, the main portal. I'm, I'm glad. Yeah, just tell me. Tell me what I should do and I will do my best. Obviously, there are other things going on, but I will do my best. Awesome. Okay, well, let's definitely... Um put together kind of some some like thoughts on this and we'll try to keep in the in the short term if you could kind of keep this as your sort of uh space and like make sure as we're moving forward you're kind of like hey that that meeting did we kind of come up with that that would probably be helpful you know I'll try to remember as well just to like check in um but that would be I think in the short and, term and just to clarify that training that we're having it's not going to happen probably until later this year so just oh, okay, yeah, yeah. expectation it's not going to be in like the next month or two so it'll be no later. problem okay thank but you. even more reason to you know make sure we'll try to remember to keep that on forefront there and um yeah thank you will so much for sharing that i think it's something we don't we don't get that perspective often enough and um i'm really grateful that you were willing to share that with us to help us like be better as an organization and to try to address you know i think we're all here with the goal of helping people get access to legal services because when you get involved with the law it's really scary it's really scary for me and i'm a lawyer and i'm like <laughs> so 
I really, really appreciate you bringing this forward, you know, ask and, and, and taking the time to like share this with us. And we, you know, we'll do our best to try to back you up on making these, some of these improvements. I, I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate everybody who, who listened and gave feedback. I hope, I hope it doesn't end here. Obviously, I know that that's how we we're limited in how we can move forward. Um, but I, I am so ready and willing on, on this one, especially for the small things where, where they might be able to make small adjustments and just highlight it for awareness's sake. Because my experience is as soon as folks know they want to they want to do better and they want to address it but sometimes they don't even realize that they've created this filter because they're just so overwhelmed yeah um, so I, I i really appreciate the time to to everybody um and i'm glad to be a resource feel free to email me or call me or text me whatever and i will uh, chime in if i can and help out awesome thank you Okay, well, with that and our and our sort of task going forward with some ideas on how to try to address this issue, are there are there any other things that we should raise before we adjourn for the day? Okay, hearing none, I assume we can move to adjourn and we'll see you all, I guess, I don't know if it's next month or whatever. I haven't looked at my calendar, but in the meantime, we'll we'll work on, you know, brainstorming some ideas, some additional ideas for to address your stuff will and you're always welcome to reach out to me we can have a call if you have come up with other stuff you want to talk about june is the next meeting um it's before the commission. That, that week of the commission meeting is also there's a rules committee meeting okay perfect well, we'll see you then thank you again to brady and raul for their work on the rule and um we really appreciate it and we'll see you all in june have a great one have a good memorial day weekend our next holiday before bye everyone <laughs> thanks everyone Bye bye